So the second talk for today's first session is by Anna from Oxford, and she'll be talking about investigating aqueous alteration in carbonaceous chondrites using magnetic measurements of things, the QDM. Oh, hello everyone, um, my name is Anna Pagu. I am a final year PhD student at Oxford working with um, James Clare and Connell on really all things meteorites and magnets, but today in particular I want to talk to you about um, carbonation chondrites, in particular CM and CO chondrites. Um, we've been working on basically understanding aqueous alteration in them using um, spatially resolved magnetic measurements taken with the QDM. Um, the reason we're doing this is pretty much the entirety of James's talk. So, Thanks for that, Rich. We're like really handy to have them one after the other, actually. Um, but yes, um, all of these meteorites are, have been used recently to understand the early solar system, in particular, the protoplanetary nebula and planet formation. So they're really interesting if we can understand them. Um, but they are incredibly complicated, as I have been finding out over the past four years. Um, and in particular, in the past, one problem has been um, what James was talking about, the magnetite is not usually magnetized in CM chondrites, and that has been um, um, affecting measurements. So the primary aim of this talk, of this talk, of this project, is to characterize the magnetic mineralogy at the micro scale. So actually, spatially resolve it, see what's magnetized and what isn't, with a particular focus on whether magnetite is magnetized. Um, and secondly, although I won't have time to do this to talk about this today and I've not actually done it yet. Uh, but in, this is in the wider context of how or if magnetic remnants can be inherited during alteration. In other words, if magnetite is not magnetized, why is that? Is that because it formed and it didn't inherit its alteration? Uh, it didn't inherit its remnants? Is it because it formed when there wasn't field? Is it something else entirely? That is, yeah, that is the, that is the grand plan. Um, as I said, I won't really get into that today, but that is why I'm presenting the results within the framework of alteration. Um, but first, a little bit of context. So chondrites are undifferentiated meteorites. In particular, we will be looking at two groups, the CM and COs. No, those two. Um, they are considered sister, sister groups which means that they may be related mineralogically. Um, the COs are not very altered. They are some of the least altered meteorites we have, whereas the CMs um, show a range of alteration rates. Um, all of the meteorites we look at are unheated, um, although there are some meteorites in these groups that are heated, but not the ones, not these ones. Um, it is unlikely that the COs are the direct precursors to CMs because of some mineral mineralogical differences, but they're still interesting to see as a before in terms of alteration, right? These are the actual meteorites we are looking at. They are all Antarctic meteorites. So they have really catchy names. I will not be using the names too much. Hopefully we'll see how it goes. But yes, these are the meteorites. Um, and I'll present results from four of them in particular. Um, here are the broad mineralogy of the two groups. Um, I just put them here to show the effects of alteration broadly. So we go from something like 70% major minerals to 10% approximately, the rest just goes to clays, um, which are not very helpful. Um, the other thing that happens is that metal in CO chondrites usually just alters the magnetite or sulfides. Um, we don't really see very much metal in CM chondrites. I put that to mean there's two grains per meteorite, that sort of, that sort of amount. Um, interestingly, there's more magnetite in the CO chondrites than the CMs. I don't think anyone's explained this yet. I noticed this when I was making the slide. I was like, and this is probably going to cause problems down the line. Um, but yes, this shows that the COs are actually are still a little bit altered. Um, and just because we're talking about, about magnetite here, I thought I'd include um, the reactions, the more straightforward reactions that produce magnetite. We can produce it in a number of ways from all of metal, troilite, and pyrotite by adding water. And the water is coming from the ice that accreted in the meteorites as it formed. Um, and just to be clear, this is all about. Um, I'm only talking about pseudomorphic magnetite formation. Um, I've not really thought about uh, framboids and plaquettes yet. That's because we don't really see them in CM chondrites apart from Munchkin. Um, I probably, based on my discussion, I probably should be thinking about um, the framboids and plaquettes. Yeah, I got some results about 18 hours ago, which are completely rewriting my discussion. So this is going to be great. <laughs> um, all right. And oh, 
sorry. Hello, yes. Um, all right, so with the aim in mind of characterizing my terminology and particular magnetite, we are using the new um, QDM in Oxford, which essentially allows us to map a magnetic field onto a sample directly. Um, it's not giving us very much um, information in terms of what is actually in there, I mean, in terms of like, optical imagery. So we're also using optical microscopy. Um, I have not used the SEM yet for fears of somehow affecting the magnetic signal, um, which does mean that the results sometimes uh, well, I, I'm sometimes not sure what sulfide is which, basically, but I can tell the difference between sulfide and magnetite, so that's okay. Um, finally, we've applied um, some ARMs to some of the samples and basically redone the QDM measurements to see what the ARM has done to the mineralogy. Right, so in terms of results, the way I have structured this is I've um, structured them in terms of alteration. So we start with um, almost non-altered um, meteorites, so the COs. And then we go to some alteration, then more alteration, and so on. I will actually start with the CMs just because they are the main um, target for the study. And then we'll very briefly talk about CMs as well. Um, the first CM chondrite we look at is that one over there. I said I will not be using the names. I will not be using the names. Um, here is a um, little chondro. Um, it's got some metal around it. Um, I'll zoom into that metal in a second. And this is a QDM map. So here, the, um, this green color just means there's no signal. And then the yellow and the blue means there is a local magnetic field. Where we get the yellow and the blue together, that is a little dipole. So that's probably a little mountain ray in there. Over here, um, so just zooming into the chondro, there we go. Um, so this metal is very, really reflective. So that's actually has, that's what's caused this fuzziness. Um, the actual brightness of the metal is kind of scattering the laser a little bit. So that's what's causing that noise. And I thought there are some ways to get rid of that um, if they've not worked. Um, so I will drop, be dropping an email to the people that wrote the stuff that be like, help. But yes, this is, this is why the fuzziness is there. Um, what, the reason I'm interested in this is because these grains have actually started to form magnetite around these cracks. Um, because this is optical microscopy and solar reflected light, I can't really zoom in more than this. Um, this could really use an SEM image at some point. Um, but yes, the magnetite starts forming. Um, right now, we can't really tell whether that has its own field just because of A, the noise, B, that's a really strong grain and it's kind of drowning out everything else. Um, but it would be interesting to see whether um, that magnetite has already acquired something or whether it doesn't at all. The other thing to notice is we can see the outline of the chondro just in this, um, I call it a faint glow. It's just because of the really tiny, mag slightly magnetic particles in there, which are just causing a little signal. <laughs> um, this is what this material looks like where there is metal. Um, usually it just, it looks more like this. Just put it on the screen just about. Um, these are again two chondrules um, and there's no magnetite and there's no metal in here. Um, all we see here is pyrotype. And it's just causing this, these little trace signals. I've used the higher binning for this picture just to amplify the signal a little bit, otherwise you wouldn't really be able to see it. Now, with the magnetite in this, A, it's very rare, and B, it's not actually magnetized as far as I've seen. Um, I could not find a good picture to show that, which is a little bit upsetting, um, but that's because I've been taking the, the optical images on my phone due to logistical issues last time. Um, so, but yes, the magnetite in this does not appear to carry a magnetic signal. Moving on to more alteration. Um, with this meteorite, we have done the same thing. We've measured the, the primary magnetization on the QDM. This is again a chondral and it's got inclusions of pyrotype. Um, there is no metal in this as far as I can remember. It is a little bit stronger and it all looks magnetized in the same direction as well. So this is the meteorite where we've taken it a step further. Um, this is all presented in a poster, by the way, Jack's poster, please go and check it out later. Um, so we've applied a series of ARMs, um, 100 and 200 micro Tesla. Um, we've actually ended up demagnetizing the sample, um, which is not what, which is not what I wanted to do. Um, it's completely consistent with this just being paratide because it's close to these less than 115 mil Tesla, which is the AC field we used. So then it's just, um, it's just demagnetized the sample essentially. There was nothing in the ARM that appeared um, to be magnetized after the ARM was acquired, which suggests to me that either there isn't magnetite in here to be magnetized, or it's just very, very, very small and the signal just can't be picked up. 
Um, please also note the difference in the color bar. So this is, the range on this is double the range on this. So they, these are really quite weak. Um, because applying a 200 microtesla ARM didn't reproduce the NRM at all, we can conclude that the field amount size, this is um, more than 60 microtesla. And here we use calibration of 1.34. And once again, assuming the RM and CRM ratio equals one. Sorry about that. Um, yes, the sample does not appear to contain one time, but it might just be too small. And finally, um, these are the results that I got 16 hours ago that have written my conclusions. Um, so this is the most old meter that we have. Um, and there is a lot of magnetite in it. I say a lot, it's three volume percent. It's not quite, it's not a lot, but it's quite obvious and easy to identify. Um, everything that the arrow is pointing at is magnetite. And there's also a little bit of metal there um, and a little bit of peritite there. Um, everything in here is magnetic, um, as far as I can tell. So magnetite in this appears to be magnetized even though it wasn't before. So we've gone to the highest alteration grade and suddenly magnetite starts showing up, which is interesting and complicated. And if anyone has any idea what, what this means, please do tell. Um, but just before going into what I think is happening, um, just wanted to show what the CO chondrites look as well. Um, immediately we can see they look quite different. So they're a lot more detailed. Um, they're a lot stronger as well. The grains on here, oh, hi Richard. <laughs> the grains on here are larger generally the magnetic grains um there's a lot of metal a lot of metal type um i just wanted to point out this really nice one over here um which i believe yeah so zooming into it, we can see some clear magnetite there um and it is magnetized it is corresponding to um to a signal over here so yeah if the co's are the precursors to CMs, then somehow the magnetite has lost the signal. Interesting. All right, what does this mean in terms of um, the carriers? From previous work, we know that CMs carry a remnants of, well, they have measurements that are all the way in between 10 and 77, probably around 70 microtesla, usually carried by pyrotite, sometimes by magnetite. In this study, we are confirming that it is carried by pyrotite. Some rare metal is magnetized and at higher alteration grades, it appears the magnetite is magnetized or is at least carrying a magnetic signal too. Um, in the COs, everything is very magnetic. That could just be because the grains are very large. So in the QDM, the, a larger grain will show you a stronger signal because of the stray field coming out of a multi-domain grain. So that could be why. Um, I didn't even put this on the slide because it felt really silly, but yeah, in terms of the picture that we're building here is we are looking at um, everything being very magnetic in the COs. Then we go to just pyrotype being magnetic in the lower grade, lower alteration grade CMs. And then the magnetite does start to show a signal again. So what is happening, um, she asks. Um, one thing that I noticed is the magnetite isn't really very visible. Um, many meteorites didn't seem to have it at all. Um, which is strange because from XRD data, which is a bulk technique, we know that there is at least 2%, uh, 2 volume percent magnetite in every single meteorite. So whilst I can't rule out heterogeneity, i.e. all of these meteorites have brochure, so it's not impossible that the sample that I got just doesn't contain magnetite, I suppose. It's always possible, it's always a caveat. Alternatively, um, it might be that the magnetite is just too small. The single domain range for magnetite is very tiny off the top of my head, something like 100 nanometers. So maybe this is just not visible, especially because I've only done optical microscopy. This might just, this is why I might not have seen that. And with those small grains, it's possible that they might not be above um, noise level in the QDM either. Or, so perhaps the less altered CNs, which don't have as much magnetite, didn't show it because of this. Although I have looked at large pseudomorphic magnetite in those and it was not showing up. So maybe, maybe this is um, the problem. Now, if this is the case that the magnetite um, um, is not visible, not because it's not there, but because it's too small, this might suggest a different mechanism to actually form it other than pseudomorphic replacement because the, the middle grains you've seen them, they're quite large. So if they just pseudomorphically change the magnetite and that magnetite will be there in that size. So something has to make it really, really small for it to not show up at all anymore. Um, secondly, if 
this is the case, and actually all magnetite carries a signal in the QDM. Why don't, don't we see this in book analysis? Um, here are my questions, and I don't really have answers. Uh, but yes, um, in terms of future work, there are a number of things I want to do. So I want to repeat the IRM acquisition on a number of different samples and um, take it further to IRM as well, basically reproduce that signal that they had initially. I want to do more QDM and optical microscopy on zeochondrides. Eventually, when I'm happy that everything has been measured, I will put them in the SEM um, and do some proper like mineral prioritization. <laughs> Um, Micromounting modeling is on the cards, so doing, seeing how mineral changes um, in the lab that then coupled with modeling how it's supposed to change and seeing how that um, corresponds to each other. And finally, I'd like to do some measurements on chondrites which have been altered in the lab to see if they've acquired um, field from the earth as, they, as they're altering. But yes, thank you so much. So we'll be taking questions online and in person. So Rich Jackson has a question. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, really interesting. Um, you may have mentioned this. I may, oops, I may have missed it. Um, in your QDM images, are they NRM? Yes. States? And, mm -hmm. Okay. And have you compared those to, say, uh, ARM or SIRM states? Um, I've not compared them to IRM yet. Um, that's the next step, but yes, not yet. We have seen a meteorite which appears to have had a, coll a collector's magnet stuck to it. Um, it's and it looks really strong, which is giving us like quite a quite a bit of faith that once we apply an IRM, it will show up. I actually have a picture of it somewhere. There you go. But that's really strong. It's why is that so blurry? But that's really strong. It's like an order of magnitude above everything we've seen. Okay, thanks. There's a question online. If you could unmute yourself and. So Anna, uh, you know, very nice work. Uh, I'm very jealous of the of the the, the stuff that you're working on. Uh, I uh, I wondered if uh, you if you were intending to do some fib slice and view to build up uh, a more accurate picture of the kind of mineralogy and the grain morphologies that you have. So it's something you're considering to do. Sorry, would you mind repeating that? I lost you right in the middle. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if you'd thought about uh, extracting the uh, grain morphologies by doing a fib slice and view and re you know reconstructing the grains and maybe then doing the micromagnetic models from that. Yes. Um, I Well, it's something I thought about. It, there's a lot that I think we can do um, as long as it's non-extracted that is. Um, but no, that, that's, that's a good idea. Okay, uh, just a, an, an advertisement for Merrill though, if you want to do the chemical remnants in the, in the latest version of Merrill, there's lots of new tools to allow you to, to do yeah, that. Yeah, we, we are planning to do that. Fantastic. All right, thanks very much. So we have one time for one more question. One question. Thank you. Thank you.